Keeping violent schizophrenics from taking over your subway? Not hard. I could do that in an afternoon. I have firearms. Done. Man, I don't even know where to start with you. Like, <laughs> well, there's so much. Start with the hostile ones. Let me, let me start here, okay? Because I don't understand this part, all right? You're, you're, you know, when I look at who you are, we've been watching you for, how many of you have been watching this man for decades? I didn't, you know, see, you were at CNN. Yep. MSNBC. Yep. Uh, what was the other comment? Oh, I don't know, a long list of. And then how, how did you end up at Fox? Why, why that transition? Um, well, all my transitions have been involuntary. Uh, <laughs> I'm all about doing this. I'm all about the status quo. You know, I, my parents got divorced when I was a kid, so I hate change. Um, but I'm not in charge of the universe. So it just sort of comes upon you, just like I think it does in the life of every person. You know, you've got chest pains, and then it turns out to be something horrible, or you wake up one morning and get fired without, you know, previous warning. And, and it's such a blessing. How many times have you been fired? Oh, I've been fired a ton. <laughs> I've been cheerfully disobedient my whole life. Um, so... You know, but you, I mean, obviously, if you work in my business or really any business, if you push it a little bit, you're, you're going to get punished for it. But that's not bad. It's good for two reasons. One, it forces you to take stock of yourself and to stop blaming everyone else for your, so you get fired. Anyone who's been fired has had this experience and you sit there and you're thinking, well, first, how do I tell my wife, you know, that I'm a loser? Um, and second, you know, how did these people shaft me? And, you know, you sort of brood on their faults. And then over time, you begin to realize, especially if you've been fired a number of times like me, if the same thing keeps happening to you, it's your fault. And that is the most useful realization you can ever have. It's my fault. And that's where wisdom begins. And um, so then you think, well, OK, I've got all these little kids, and I have to support them. What did I do wrong last time? And then you think, I didn't do anything wrong. I'm pretty perfect. Everyone else sucks. But because you have no choice, because you have to make a living, speaking for myself, you have to confront, you know, your faults. And it's really a matter of doing the things that you were born to do that you're naturally good at and avoiding the things that you're not good at. It's really simple. It's knowing yourself. And only fire, being fired forces you into that. And the second thing that it does is it humiliates you, which is so essential. It's so important for a man, particularly a middle-aged man, to be humiliated regularly because... It puts your life in a perspective, like especially if you're kind of successful and you see this with men, they really all start to believe that they're Jesus after a while. You just can't help it. Everyone's kissing your ass. Oh, you're so great. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm pretty great, to be honest. Pretty, pretty great. And the second you start to believe that about yourself, you start to make very unwise decisions. It's called hubris. It's mist mistaking yourself for God. And being humiliated puts it I mean, every good thing begins with the acknowledgement that you're not God. You're not in control. You can't extend your life by one day. That's just a lie. You can't control the future or the environment around you. The best you can do is respond to it wisely. And knowing that is the, is, is the beginning of success and wisdom. In my opinion, it's the basis of AA. It's the basis of every world's religion. And it's just true. And so when you get fired and, like, everyone's embarrassed and your kids don't mention it, because it's too shameful and your neighbors avert their gaze as you pull into the driveway at night, like, oh, there's the loser. I read about it in the New York Times. He's a fascist. It's kind of great. You know, it's kind of great. And what you don't want is to be surrounded by toadies or butt kissers or yes men or flatterers. Last thing I'll say is a flatterer is much more dangerous to you and to your soul and much more dishonest, actually, than a persistent critic. A persistent critic may teach you something important about yourself, like you're failing to do this, and possibly you'll be like, you know, you're right, I should fix that. But a flatterer lulls you into a false sense of omnipotence. And it's very easy to believe flattery. It's tough to believe criticism, but it's important. It's very easy to be like, you know what, I, I think I'm actually, you know, the reincarnation of the Dalai Lama. I think that's true. You can convince a man of that very, very easily, and it will kill him you know, in the end, so. So, so how do you, how do Ow! you? Oh, I don't know who you are, but I like you. I always like the owl ladies. It's like a Led Zeppelin show, 1974. Ow! can you take your Bic lighter and hold it to the ceiling? It's a cougar. Sorry. That's a 10X cougar. <laughs> um, 
how do you, so you're talking about critics, okay? But, but I imagine that some, some of the criticism that Tucker Carlson has gotten has been just hate and just people trying to put you down or trying to throw you off your game or to infiltrate and negate the people around you or, and cause them to be, have doubt about you. Oh, for, well, I wouldn't know since I don't read any criticism of me ever. I read nothing about myself ever under any circumstances. I barely go on the Internet. So you don't search the net? Oh, we don't have a television. I don't listen to radio. I don't like the Internet. Sorry, Internet, um, even though I work on the Internet. And, no, I'm grateful for a platform, um, but, no. You don't, I don't go online? You don't see any negative? No, I don't sent- read about myself ever. I never have. Well, uh-huh. I know who I am. I don't need someone who doesn't know me to tell me, you know, so. Um, I know who I am. No, no, well, I'm, I'm 54, you know, <laughs> I'm not a genius, but I have learned more about myself over time. And um, so self-obsession, narcissism is death, obviously. I don't even like mirrors because I don't want to think about myself, but self-knowledge, and there's a huge difference. In fact, it's all the difference in life. You should know yourself, but not make yourself the center of your world, if that makes sense. Like, know who you are, know what you're good at, know, more importantly, what you're bad at. Um, That's essential. What am I bad at? You lie to yourself. But I think I'd be a... I thought I was a really good manager, for example, just because I like people and I like talking and I think I can inspire people. That's very different from managing people. And it took me, like, 10 years to realize I can't manage anybody. And everyone I manage becomes, like, alcoholic. (laughs) And that's a bad sign. And so that was a hard-earned lesson about my limitations, but an absolutely essential lesson. So I'm not managing anybody. I would never manage someone. And you'd be a fool to try to be managed by me because you would start drinking in the morning. So that's But, but you do manage yourself. I try to manage myself. I do. But anyway, the point is you don't learn anything from reading manufactured hate or even sincere hate. I think there is sincere hate. It's not all fake. Um, about yourself. You, so I pay zero attention to the opinions of anybody I don't know and love. Zero. None. And I pay exquisite attention, incredibly close attention to the opinions of people who love me, which is another way of saying I do not give emotional control to strangers or crazy people. Why would you do that? Yeah. That's like handing a handgun to a toddler. Yeah. And I'm a gun person. I carry a gun. I'm as pro-gun as you could possibly be. I hunt. Are you I, carrying right now? Yes, always. And But... I am, and I always have. Not, not simply for protection, because it's a statement of autonomy. I'm an adult man, I'm not a slave. My job is to protect myself and my family, and it, that's a symbolic statement of that. Okay, so that's why I carry. But anyway, but the point is, I'm not against guns, I'm totally for guns, but I wouldn't give it a gun to a child because the child might shoot people accidentally. And it's the same with emotional control. I will hand my wife total emotional control. I've been with her 40 years. I trust her more than anybody. My children, same. The people who work for me, same. I love them. My huge family, same. But I'm not going to give some freak, some celibate, you know, Xanax-addled freak on the Internet emotional control over me because that would be insane. And so I don't read it. I don't let it into my head for the same reason I don't read the New York Times. It's lies. Why would I want it rattling around in my gourd? No thanks. Um, So, yeah. So you, you haven't read it, but like some of, the, it's, some of what I've read about you says <laughs> you're the most influential voice in right-wing media. When I see you, I don't think that, but that's what I they say. I don't think that either. By the way, they say that without a close second. What uh, would it mean? What does that even mean to you? I have no idea. Um, I have no idea what that means. And actually, the categories of left and right are getting so muddy You know, I voted Republican my whole life. I mean, since you asked a political question, I'll give you a political answer. I voted Republican my whole life because, like, what are the options? Um, (laughs) But then you look at the people, but I've never been that enthusiastic about it. They're politicians. They're all liars, okay? But most of them, and they have incredibly weird personal lives, um, and their wives hate them, and their kids don't respect them. Therefore, I don't respect them. So, but what are the options? And there aren't any. And then you look up and you see these people you voted for or sort of supported or, in my case, gave airtime to. And they don't care at all about their voters at all. They're totally selfish. They're liars. And you really think maybe the difference isn't between Republican and Democrat or left and right. It's between lying and honesty. It's between people who are going to tell the truth and live in an honest way and people who are captured by lies. Maybe it's that simple. Maybe we don't need a left and a right or Republican and Democrat. We need a a party or a movement of people who are totally committed to telling the truth to themselves as well, in their personal lives as well as their public lives, like committing, I'm not going to lie. 
Doesn't mean I have to say everything I think. I have all kinds of stupid and ugly opinions I keep to myself, and I think I should. I think we all should, actually. But I'm never going to lie. I'm going to make a commitment, a moral commitment. The same way, like, you wake up New Year's Day, and you're like, oh, I'm fat and bloated. I'm going to lose 35 pounds. No more sugar till Easter. Great. It's called Lent. And people do that. Why not make the same pledge, a much more important pledge, one that will save your soul and the country, and say, I'm not going to lie at all. I'm not going to shade the truth. I'm not going to say one thing that I believe is untrue. I will be wrong all the time because I'm a person. I don't have omniscience. Like, I'm going to make mistakes, and that's fine. I'll admit it when I do, but I'm never going to lie. And if you do that, you will find a transformation that's way more intense than anything the Atkins diet can give you. I'm serious. Way more than keto, you will find a total transformation of, of your soul. And you will find a strength coming over you that you couldn't imagine you could experience ever. Like you will become bulletproof because when you stop lying, you've got nothing to hide. And when you have nothing to hide, you are strong. And when you are strong, people can smell it immediately because, because people experience other people on a subverbal and subrational level. We spend, I mean, my business is words. Like I can talk about anything. That's why I'm paid to talk a lot. But most people don't hear a word you say. They're like your dog. Rah, 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 rah. Dinner, got it. You know what I mean? Your dog knows you intimately. Your dog, if it's a smart dog, most dogs are, can predict what you're gonna do on the basis of no words whatsoever. Dog doesn't speak English. We, we believe they don't speak English. And how? Because the dog just watches. The dog can smell. That's how we experience other people. Is this person lying? I don't know, but I can smell deception on another person. I can smell creepiness. I don't know what's, you're hiding something. I don't know what it is, what kind of freaky stuff you're into, but I can smell it and I don't trust you. That's all real. And so if you're honest, other people can feel the vibe coming off you, a vibe of power and fearlessness. And it's not a pose. That single act, deciding never to lie, if I had to give business advice, I know nothing about business at all. Don't let me invest your money. I will lose all of it. I would never- Leave that to me. I give, I give it to him. But if I could give a piece of business advice, it would be never lie because people follow strength mm. and they listen carefully when they know that you're strong. And the only way to be strong is to rid yourself of any deception at all, like any. And then nothing can hurt you. What are you gonna do to me? <laughs> oh, you're gonna kill me? Oh, you're gonna, oh, I'm so afraid. I'm gonna die anyway. I'm not afraid of you at all. And if you're not afraid of people, it rocks their world. You don't need to say it. They just know. You're not afraid. Ooh, that person's not afraid. Better kill him. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, you know, to me, that's a very spiritual, yeah. you know, like I don't see that from you on TV. I think I'll see it more from what you're about to release. But um, that to me is a very spiritual, very strong core. I am who I am. Like yeah. it or don't like it. But it's cost you. Has it cost you, or did that no. benefit you? No, I mean, your life is going to be, like, what do you think your life's going to be? Like, an unending ascent to success? Maybe. I've actually met people like that, and when they get to the peak, to the pinnacle, to the Mount Everest of success, when they make a billion dollars, actually, I have a close friend who did that, who literally did that. Built his company. It's a famous company. It's a retail company. You would know it. He took no debt. None. His dad gave him 50 grand at the start. He spent for 30 years. He got $2 billion, a check, from a PE firm that bought him out. And typically the way that works is they like give it to you in tranches and you have to stay and like run it. They didn't do that with him. They just wrote him a $2 billion check. It's crazy, the only person I've ever heard of who got that. And it totally wrecked his life. Hmm. Because he was the dog who caught the car. He it wrecked his life. It wrecked his, oh absolutely, it blew up his marriage. He was deeply unhappy, he started drinking. Because what he found when he achieved what he dreamed of achieving was that it wasn't actually as great as he thought. It was the fight, it was the struggle. It was getting there that made him feel like a man and made him proud of himself and his family proud of him. And so actually, you know, if you made a billion dollars, like what does that mean? Well, you get to sit in bed at the Four Seasons in Jakarta and eat French toast all morning, you know, that, that's great for a weekend. Maybe you've got like five hot girls with you. That's, you know, it's kind of fun for a weekend. 
or whatever. Like, imagine your dream. Like, I get as rich as anyone could ever be. I'm basically Solomon. I can do whatever I want. What does that actually look like? It looks like a kind of zany weekend. It doesn't look like the rest of your life. And if you lived like that for the rest of your life, you'd be dead in a year. And a lot of them are. So what you want actually in life is purpose, meaning I'm doing this for a reason. And that only comes through struggle. Period. There's no other way. And so you're going to have struggle in your life. Unexpected, horrible things will happen to you. And the beauty of that experience is it's fine. People you love died. That's going to happen. It just happened to me. It's going to happen. And you can't control it because you're not God. But you can experience in it beauty and joy and meaning. And once you watch someone you love die and see that not only is it not that bad, it's like one of the most beautiful things you've ever seen, not because death is beautiful. Death is a tragedy. And the death of a loved one is the greatest tragedy. But still, in the midst of that, the greatest tragedy, there's something that's incredibly beautiful and dignified. Once you see that, it's like, what are you going to throw at me now? Like, you're going you're gonna to take my house away? Okay, go ahead. Like, there's no fear after that. And so it is the struggles that make the whole thing worth it. It's not the French toast at the Four Seasons. That's a lie. That's a lie. So be grateful for the struggles. And they're inevitable anyway. <laughs> the, the, so to be clear on your, your friend, though, the billion dollars isn't what made him unhappy. It's the loss of purpose. Yes. Oh, no. Yeah, and yeah. just to be clear, like, his whole life was building this company. I wish I could say, no, I, I cannot. But it's you can company. say it. No, I can't. But it's, you can tell me. He's probably, he's just such a wonderful man. But, no, it wasn't the money. Of course, he spent his whole life trying to get this. It was two things. It was one, it was sometimes like you build up the end of a journey to such an extent that you miss that the whole point is the journey. <laughs> That's the point. <laughs> right, okay, so there's that. But there's also what you said so insightfully, which is, the loss of purpose, of meaning, like what, what's the point? And he, and I didn't tell you the best part of the story, which is he totally pivoted. He's a very wise person, obviously a very dynamic and smart person. And he just said, no, 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 the purpose of my life is to serve other people and make them happy. 100%. And he started doing that in really creative, innovative, I don't want to give it away, but in innovative ways. And now he's joyful all the time. But the point is, he didn't know that yeah. because like the rest of us, he's in this tunnel and he can't, you know, see anything in front of him or anything behind him. He's just, like, struggling every day. Like, I got to win. I got to win. I got to win. And then he wins. And he's like, oh, wait, I had no plan for winning. <laughs> right? This is not a problem I have had. <laughs> but I think it is instructive to see it. You, uh, you, you grew up in La Jolla? I grew up in La Jolla. Yeah, so we li I lived in La Jolla for 12 years. Fantastic place. Do you think... I've never asked this question publicly, but the beauty of that, like it's perfect almost every day, the picturesque, blue skies, the ocean. Do you think that that made you better or worse? Oh, much worse. Yeah, it's a nightmare to live in a Nerf world. It's like the French toast at the Four Seasons. It's totally bad. I went back to San Diego where I grew up and was totally happy. I had like a great childhood. Um, thankful we had a lot of family drama, so that kept me from becoming even shallower than I already am. Because we actually had things to worry about because you know, family drama. But, um, but I went back a few years ago and they, the driver picks me up at Lindbergh Field in San Diego and he's like, welcome to San Diego. Have you been here before? I was like, actually, I grew up here. Really? I said, I don't come back very often. What's, you know, what's going on? He goes, well, it's uh, 73, partly cloudy, um, yeah. moving up to about 76 midday, broken clouds, and then clearing overnight overnight low of 67 tomorrow. And he literally gives me the weather report like he's a meteorologist. And I start laughing like he's joking. He wasn't joking. And I thought, that is the downside of living in the prettiest place in the world. It becomes about things that A, you can't control, and that B, aren't ultimately that important, like the weather. And weirdly, I have, in later life, moved to the place in the United States with the worst weather in the continental United States, northwestern Maine, where there's like, you know, it's like you could freeze to death very easily just taking the trash out. Not that we have trash collection, uh, but let's say we did. Just loading the garbage bags into the back of your truck to bring them to the dump like you could die, you know, because it's that cold. And I really love it, and so does my wife. I love being in a place where the seasons change. There's a poignance to fall. Everything's dying. And then there's a bleakness to winter, which really speaks to me. There's nothing there. It's just white and the bright 
you know, green pine trees and the incredible blue sky, and it's just like a kind of beauty that you don't see in a beach community. And then the summer is idyllic, and then the cycle starts again. And it's like, I love that because it mirrors your life. The main problem with beautiful places like La Jolla is that you can convince yourself that you never die. And it's so important to keep your impending death in mind at all times. And it doesn't make you sad, it, it actually makes you joyful because you realize I have limited time, I can't just dilly-dally, I have to do something meaningful every single day. Every moment has inherent meaning because those moments are limited. And when you live in a place where your biggest concern is whether it's gonna be partly cloudy or clear, you don't, you're not confronted with that. And so I really like it. I love fall because it's like, wow, this is incredibly sad. Everything is dying all around me, just like I am. I'm 54. I better do something meaningful. I call my kids. I love you. <laughs> it's like this amazing, you know? Do you think the threat in the environment is good for you and good for people? Do I think the natural environment is good for no, you? No, no, threats. Threats in the environment. Like, of course. Like describing threats. Of course. Threats are essential. First of all, you feel them anyway. Why? When we took all the threats out of American life, when we banned lawn darts, okay, that was the beginning of the end. I personally love lawn darts. Do you know what a lawn dart is? It's like a handheld missile that those of us who remember the 70s recall with great vividness. You know, your parents are kind of drunk, smoking cigarettes. On a Sunday afternoon, all the kids, totally unsupervised and kind of physically unclean, are in the background with these like spikes with fins on them, throwing them in between each other's feet. And it could just impale you. It could literally crucify you to the lawn. And the parents are like, oh, be careful. Can I have a cocktail? <laughs> it was an awesome country. And then the moms took over and are like, actually, the main risk in life is getting hurt. No. The main risk in life is leading a meaningless life. That's the main risk. You're going to get hurt. OK, that's just going to happen. And then at the end, you're going to die. So I don't even accept the terms of the framing. If you think the worst thing that can happen to me is I die, you're a freaking idiot, because I am going to die. The worst thing that can happen to me is that I waste my life. Mm. And so you take all those threats away, and what happens? The incidence of panic attacks, anxiety disorders, goes off the chart, and everyone's on Xanax. What, what's the connection there? Well, the connection there is very, very simple. People are, as a matter of evolutionary biology, wired to respond to threats. Your ancestors emerged from the cave into a world determined to eat them. And so that is an integral part. That is not something to eliminate. That is something to manage thoughtfully, wisely. But if you eliminate all threats, your viscera still have the inherited threat response. So if there's, if there's no lawn darts or saber-toothed tigers, you're just going to convince yourself, because that's what a panic attack is. It's uncontrollable fear with no known source that takes you over, makes you feel like you can't breathe. I'm sure everyone in this room has had it. That doesn't happen in pre-modern societies, because they've got enough actual threats to deal with. So in other words, the way we manage threats is inherent. Threats cannot be eliminated. And they shouldn't be, because they are essential to our performance and our happiness. I have mitigated a threat. There's a threat out there. I've got it under control. I feel good about myself. My wife is proud of me. My kids are grateful or not, but I am, I feel like I'm doing my duty. It's like essential. A world with no threats, we're back to the French toast at the Four Seasons. We're wasting away. When, when, you, when you were growing up, okay, <laughs> did you see when, when did you see this version of you? Like, did you know when you were five or six years old? Your dad was in media, right? Yeah, yeah. When, when did you know, or did you know, you would become this version of yourself? Did you ever know you'd be this, this guy? No, I mean, the version <laughs> Whatever this guy changes is. all the time. <laughs> My only real intellectual commitment is to honesty. And so my views have changed so dramatically, I can't even tell you. And I'm not ashamed of that at all. I'm proud of it. Because when the evidence changes, your view should change. If you invest a ton of money in a company and it fails, you're not going to throw more money at the company because you're assessing the evidence and responding accordingly. This is obvious in business. It's less obvious in life. So you have these views at 16 or 17, and I was obviously an arrogant, super arrogant, you know, intellectually precocious kid who thought I was a genius. I wasn't, but I thought I was. And so I had all these theories on everything. Well, actually, like, what do you know? You're 17. Shut up. Not enough people told me that. And so I learned the hard way that a lot of my theories were just completely wrong. And the only thing I had going for me was the willingness to admit it because why wouldn't you admit it? There's nothing more embarrassing. It's like a man with a bad toupee. 
everyone knows you're wearing a wig. Who do you think you're fooling? Nobody. People just make fun of you. So it's better just to like pull the wig off and be like, hey, I'm bald. Everyone's like, oh, that's cool. Bald is cool. You know what? And it's the same with your ideas. It's like, I was completely wrong. I supported the war in Iraq. That didn't go very well. That's on me. And just be honest all the time. And then you're way happier. You're much, much less anxious because you're not hiding anything. And so my, whatever I have become is what we all become. We, we, we change over time. And that's not something to be ashamed of. It's something to embrace and celebrate. So would, would you go to school for? Would you, what, I didn't really go to school for anything. I, I mean, the truth is I alcohol. didn't do well in school. Yeah. Um, yeah, I got, I had a weird school experience. Uh, yeah, I mean, I was in ninth grade when I was 14. My father's like, you know, it's time for you to go to boarding school. You lived at home too long. So um, I left at 14 and went to boarding school on the other side of the country. My brother did as well. All of our relatives did as well. That's a whole long story. Um, so whether that's a good idea or not, that's what we did. And then I had lived away from home for four years by the time I went to college, so I was like totally over that. Like, yeah, I can do my own laundry and I do know how to smoke pot, okay? You know, it's like I'd already figured out all the things that you learn in high school, but at an accelerated pace. And um, so I found college completely tiresome and boring. I did not do well at all. I basically just drank and then- Finish? Finish. I mean, I spent four years there, but- Did you get, did you get a degree? I did not, no, I got married before I got a degree. And um, so I got married to my high school girlfriend. Like that was the one thing I was like, I'm out of control. I have no record of achievement at all. I just have a lot of like arrogance, but it's not rooted in reality at all. I'm actually not impress impressive at all, but she's impressive and I should marry her. So I got engaged at 21 and got married at 22. And my father-in-law said, as father-in-laws do, I really want you to have a job before you marry my daughter. And I was like, job, <laughs> job. But, you know, of course, no one would hire me, so I applied to a couple places, and they're like, what? No. And my father said, to my father, who didn't graduate high school, but was very smart, said, you should join the media. Like, there, it's not like there's a barrier to entry as long as you can write well, which I could do. That's my one skill was writing well. It's because I like to read. Uh, he's like, they'll take you. So I got a job for 14 grand in the media, and just by the grace of God, I was like, oh, wow, I like this. I'm good at this. I didn't realize then that all the so other what, people what were that disgusting. Job? What was that media job? I was the fact checker at a quarterly magazine that not one human being ever read. Um, or a fact checker. I was a fact checker for about a week, and then I became an editor. I mean, these are all fake titles. Like, I was a child. I was 22. Um, my last job had been working at a gas station in Norway, Maine. So, like, I didn't have... Oh, I'd worked in a factory. I'd worked... My dad always made us get working... We were not working class, but he made us get working class jobs. And so I was a dishwasher. I spent two summers on a construction crew. I had like only blue collar experience, but I liked words and I liked reading. So it just came naturally to me and I just liked it. And then I did it for a couple of years and then I wound up completely by accident on TV, which I never expected to do. And then by this point I had some children. We had kids really young and I was like, oh, I really need the money. I think I'll go into TV. It's stupid, I don't watch TV. I look down on TV people, but it pays. And then I kept getting fired, and I was like, oh, I don't think, I think I'm getting fired because I don't take this job seriously. Maybe I should take it seriously. And then as soon as I took it seriously, I did much better, as you do when you take your job seriously. And, um, and then I really, be I got to love TV, you know? I did it for 27 years, and it was really interesting, and I'm glad I don't do it now, but uh, I did like it. But you're getting ready to have a big, you know, you don't like TV. Well, you've no, been I mean, in TV. I like you didn't like those people, but you became those people. For sure. Well, that's, you know, that's what happens in life. You know? yeah. <laughs> You're like, so, so, how did I get here? <laughs> it's yeah. like wild. So, so now, I mean, I know we have, I, how many of you know about Tucker Carlson Network, TCN? So you said you're not a good businessman. No. But, <laughs> but have you, have you. But do you have an alpaca farm you want me to invest in? No, I don't. Timeshares in Cabo? No, I'm in. I don't. Some uh, sketchy, some sketchy digital currency you made up. Okay. No. <laughs> um, how do you think about like when you're? Do you even think about marketing, like marketing yourself, like who Tucker Carlson is as a market? No. As a product. I don't even use shampoo, man. I use bar soap. Um, so Me too. No, I, I use bar soap. Yeah. I've never used a shampoo. I use Dr. Bronner's bar soap for shaving cream and shampoo. And I love it. You know, none of the chem... I'm, I'm a little bit weird. I don't want the chemicals, you know, at all. But anyway, 
I am from California in the end, right wing though I am. Uh, but anyway, no. I, you don't think about yourself though, but you are a product, Tucker. But I don't ever, you know, I really try and keep my self-awareness to a bare minimum because then you become a narcissist. If you think about how other people see you, you go crazy. And that's the experience of television is everyone's thinking about how are people seeing me? Well, I have no idea, I'm not in their heads. All I know is how I feel about myself and if my wife is proud of me, she doesn't watch, but she's like, you're so great, that's all I want. And, um, and I just, but I know when I've done a good job. I know when I'm working hard, I know when I'm telling the truth, I know when I've explained something completely, I know. I, I live up to my standards. And that's it. Those are the only standards I live up to. So that's different from running a business. So I clearly needed to go into business because I didn't work for a big company. You have to start your own company. I don't know how to do that. I went into business with my best friend because I trust him and he's really smart. And, but the reason I did it and the reason I didn't just, I love to hunt and fish, so I could have just hunt and, you know, fly fish and bird hunt for the rest of my life, which would have been great. But I really am mad about the media. I mean, I spent my whole life there, my whole life. It was an honorable profession, it's not. It's part of the problem. The media are aligned with the people in charge to oppress the population of the United States through lying. And not just a part of the media, not just the liberal media, MSNBC, all the media. They're lying about the things that actually matter. And we'll have these fake debates about this or that, you know, these little peripheral debates, but on the questions that actually matter, the economy and foreign policy, they're 100% aligned against the population of the United States. So that so deeply offends me that I thought we have to make an alternative. And the only way to do that is through a subscription service. Why? Because you cannot be dependent on advertisers because advertisers will try to influence exactly. your output. So I'll tell you just one thing I learned. Okay, this is the sum total of the knowledge collected after 27 years in the business. I always thought I'd see these drug ads. Pharma ads are the number one advertiser, pharma, on television. All TV networks, every single one. Right, left, center, doesn't matter. It's all pharma. And I'd see these ads occasionally and it'd be like, you know, talk to your doctor if you think, you know, whatever these weird names they think up, these fake names for their, these drugs. If you think it's right for you, for some totally obscure Restless woman. leg syndrome. Yeah, restless, you know, or like Bulgarian, yeah, whatever. It's all so esoteric. I feel like I'm fairly well educated. I've never heard of any of this. Yeah. How many people are actually asking their doctor for some drug they saw on television? So I asked someone who worked at pharma. Nobody. Then why are you spending billions a year to advertise in media? He goes, to prevent media from criticizing us. Mm. Oh, you're capturing the media through ad spending. Wow. It's not about the retail consumer. That's just a sideshow. Wow. It's about making sure that the executives of these News organizations never criticize pharma, the COVID vax, for example, period. And that's why, no, no, whatever you think of the COVID vax, I would know I didn't take it. But a, I'm not, you know, a lot of good people, a lot of good go, people did take it. All the anti vaxxers saying, are going to go crazy. You should for be you right allowed now. to ask questions about a drug that's mandatory. And nobody did. Why? Because they were paid not to. So that's the level of corruption. It's complete, it's profound. There's nothing that isn't corrupt. It's all a lie. And when they tell the truth, it's by accident. And so I needed to create, I felt moved, like deeply moved to create an alternative that is not dependent on advertisers. Can we show the QR code for TCN? So Tucker Carlson Network, okay? This is where facts and honesty are gonna be delivered to you every day. I'm, mar I'm doing your marketing right now. What? <laughs> I'm terrible at marketing. No, you're not. No, you're not. You're excellent. Is he an excellent marketer? Give me a 10x if he's an ex. Dude, you're, you're a natural marketer. Man, I, I, Bro, could, no, I couldn't no, but sell even snow that, cones in the desert. Even that. I'd be like, you probably don't want a snow cone, but if you do here in the Sahara, but, but, but maybe people one want of mine. This. People want this. <laughs> this is the snow cone. Well, I think people and need I, it. I yeah, think people 100%. need it. And I'm just, you know, from a... A to, you know, whatever, the way that I grew up, it was like, I'm just so uncomfortable talking about money that I, you know, it's just a quirk of the culture I grew up in, but, so I'm not. But he's always had money, that, 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 that's Yeah, why. that's true. But you see, we were talking about this behind, behind, you know. Anyway, I want you guys to hit this QR code. Take out your phone, bang it right now, so you don't need to remember it later. Just go ahead and do that for me now. Are you here in the room? Say 10X if you're here. Yeah. Good, just bang the QR code right now. You see, this is the, this is the enforcement to monetization. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what. I have never been in business, so it's a new world for me, and I don't even think of myself as in business now. I just do my thing, okay? 
um, with as little mental interference as, as possible. I really strive for that, for clarity. But I believe in this business, yeah. or I wouldn't be doing it. There's no other reason to do it. And I think as we enter this period, which is going to be incredibly volatile in the next six months in ways that no one can predict, but everyone in this room can feel that this is going to be something that we've never seen before. That is true. I can predict that with confidence. How do I know what's going on? Information is the key. When people think of war, they're like, you know, I need to have an AR-15 to protect my family, which you do, by the way, and I have a lot of them. What? You need what? AR-15. <laughs> Armalite rifle 15. Anyway, but the point is, no, the act, yeah, that's true. But the actual war is over information. Mm. What do you know? Upon which basis are you making this decision? How do you understand reality? It's a continental country. It's an incredibly large country. You have no idea what's happening in the country except through media. And so if your country were like invaded, for example, let's say it was invaded by 10 million people, just totally theoretical, okay? And the government forced you to pay for it, to fly the poorest people from the world, including people just released from prison into your country and give them much more in aid than you're getting, you obviously wouldn't put up with that if you knew it was happening. But if the media hid it from you, you had no idea how would you know, then you just sort of go about your life like, oh, it's all things are kind of the same. So somebody needs to tell the country what is happening to the country without lying. And that's our goal. That's our only goal. And he's going to tell it. How many of you think he'll actually bring you the truth? So since, we're, since you're talking about the truth now, like what, what two things I want to know about. One is selfishly the Putin interview. I'm sure everybody, is that the big question? Who are you most intimidated by, me or Putin? <laughs> you by far. Um, did you? Did, no, I'm too out of it to be intimidated. I never feel intimidated. Um, not because I'm so tough, I'm not, but just because like I see every person as, as ridiculous as I am. And a really wise person once said to me, if you want to know who you are, put a mirror outside your shower. And as you walk out, like you're in the shower thinking, I'm so smart, I'm so brilliant, the master of the universe. Then you, you walk out to the mirror and you're just kind of lumpy and furry and like, <laughs> you're ridiculous. Like naked people are ridiculous. They just look ridiculous. They're like some ungainly kind of crypto primate. <laughs> you're clearly not like who you imagine you are. So once you realize that about everybody, like nothing bothers you. So I wasn't intimidated by Putin at all. I was enraged that the US government tried to prevent me, an American citizen who was born here, whose family's been here for a long time. That's my birthright, is to say exactly what I think is true, whether you like it or not, and to talk to any person I want to, period. I was born with that right, God gave it to me, not you, and you can't take it away. And so when this, when the NSA broke into my text account, into my Signal account, and leaked the contents to the New York Times to try to prevent me from going to Russia and interviewing Putin, I was like, you know what? I'll die before I don't do this. I have only one goal. I narrowed my life down. I'm going to Russia and I'm interviewing Putin. Not because I'm even, I'm some great Russia fan. I don't know anything about Russia. I'm from La Jolla, okay? <laughs> but because you told me I couldn't. And that cannot stand. And so I spent three years setting up that interview. I did it myself, on my phone, myself, without the help of anybody. And in television, you, you, everything's collaborative. But that was the only thing I've ever done in TV. That was just me, texting with them. And, and we pulled it off, and I thought it was amazing. And I will say, in one sentence, what the most shocking thing was not Putin, who I thought was interesting and smart, but I've interviewed a million world leaders. They're all kind of the same. They run countries. They have a similar set of concerns, all of them. How do I do the best for my country? I was not surprised by that. And if he's way smarter than any leader we have, I knew that. What I was shocked by was the condition of Russia. I could not believe it. I did not expect that. I thought Moscow was the single prettiest city I've ever been in. With no crime, no graffiti, no homeless, no drugs, great food, totally beautiful and orderly. And I just, I was, I thought it was gonna be like the Soviet period with like drunk people eating potatoes and you know, puddles of urine on the sidewalk, the opposite. And my thought was, not that I want to move here, I'm American, I'm not moving to Moscow. I don't speak Russian, I'm not Russian. I want my cities to look like that, in my country where I was born, and why have my leaders allowed my cities to become garbage dumps that are physically filthy? And everyone's like, oh, it doesn't matter. No, 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 it matters. My house is clean. Yeah. I believe in order. I believe in cleanliness. You know, there's no 
a pile of dog crap in my living room because this is my living room. It's, it's not huge. I don't have a big house. I have a small house, actually. My wife and I, we don't want a big house. We have a small house. But it's clean, and it smells nice because it's our house. It's a reflection of who we are and what we care about. And if you can't even keep your city clean, how hard is it to keep your city clean? How many unemployed people are there in this country? Why aren't they cleaning up the city? I don't get it. It's not hard. What's hard is fixing Social Security. That's hard. Okay, that's a math problem. Keeping violent schizophrenics from taking over your subway, not hard. I could do that in an afternoon. I have firearms. Done. <laughs> Keeping people from crapping on your sidewalk, I could do that. How's this? You're not allowed to crap on my sidewalk. Oh, where shall I go? I don't know. Not here. Go someplace where they'll put up with it. We don't do that here. My kids' friends come over. They're like, I want to smoke weed in your living room. No. Well, my parents let me. Okay. Smoke it at your parents' house. This is my house. We don't smoke weed in my living room when we're 14. Leaf. It's really easy. When dad's home, there's order. And when dad's not home or dad's senile, there's no order. <laughs> and this is not complicated. This is not... You don't have to have a master's degree in public policy from Georgetown University to figure that out. Like, how about no? How about no? I manage a family of six people. I'm not a genius. I'm not particularly inspired. And, I, and I'm not an autocrat. I'm not, like, ordering people around. But, like, there are limits. And you can't cross the limits because I'm dad and I'm home. And why don't they do that in my country? Because they want to destroy it. That's why. And that'd be fine, except I live here and so do my kids. So how about no? You can't do that. It's not political. It's not ideological. It's obvious, it's right in front of your face. And being in Moscow, the whole time I'm getting texts like, what's Putin like, what's gonna happen to the war? I'm like, I can't get over the fact that there are no homeless schizophrenics smoking fentanyl in Red Square. And it's Russia, it's Russia. This is, a, this is like supposedly the super primitive country. It's got a much smaller GDP than whatever that is, than we do. Stop talking to me about GDP. I don't care what your stupid GDP is. It doesn't mean anything. I care about whether my daughters can walk to CVS without getting attacked. I care about whether it's pretty and orderly and people are nice to each other. Stop with your GDP talk. If I hear one more word about GDP, I'm gonna go postal on you. Shut up. Have you been to New York City? Oh, it's got a really high GDP. Really? Then how come my kids can't use the subway? Like, what are you even talking about, you freak? And going to Moscow just like completely radicalized me on that question. It didn't make me want to be Russian. It made me want to improve my country and punish the people who have degraded it on purpose for the last two decades. I'm so, you're such a nice person. I'm sorry I've gone completely insane. I, I'm sorry. No, no, I mean, I don't even hear politics in this. No, hear, it's not political. I hear it's personal. I'm enraged. I'm enraged. And I'm enraged because despite, you know, one thing, one criticism I am aware of, of me is, oh, you're a tool of a foreign power. And I'm like, well, first of all, it's almost always people who literally are tools of foreign power who are saying that to me, which cracks me up. Oh, we got to fight another war on behalf of another country. Okay, who's the tool of a foreign power? But if all the things you could say about me, many of which are true, yeah, I do eat too much pizza, I do have a tendency to get fat, I, I can be a total jerk, like, those are all real criticisms, I get it. You can't say I'm not American. That's the only thing I am, is American. And you may not agree with my views, you may hate me or my views or whatever, but all I care about is America. I was born here, I have no other passport, I'm not going anywhere else, I would not be comfortable anywhere else, I'm deeply rooted, I have a huge family, I have a lot of dogs. What would it take you fly. to leave here? Nothing, I would die here. No, what, no, I've already no matter decided, what they do. I've decided, and I've decided, and I mean it. And also, you know, I've traveled a lot my whole life since I was a child, and I know a lot of people in foreign countries, I have relatives in foreign countries, it would be pretty darn easy for me to move to a foreign country. I've had offers, oh, we'll give you a passport, or we'll, you know, whatever, as th happens when you get older and you like know a lot of people. And so I actually had to think about it and talk about it with my wife. And I I'm not gonna be in exile from my own country. And by the way, the beauty of being 54 and having grown children is I don't really care. Are you gonna throw me in boo? I'm so afraid of your prisons. I'm not afraid of you or your stupid prisons. I'm not afraid of anything except God and my wife. That's it. So I'm not I'm leaving, my wife I'm too. not leaving ever. And I've just made that choice. But what's so crazy is the number of people I know, the most successful people in our society are not at all rooted in the country. 
You're like, well, if it really goes sideways, I'll just take off and go somewhere else. If you have that attitude, if I said to my kids, like when they were at the difficult ages, like, you know, in the teen years, so I've got three teenage daughters in my house, if you can imagine, if I was like, you know, it's totally cool unless, I don't know, your cycles align and you all get grumpy the same day. Like, if that ever happened, man, I'm out. I'm getting a new wife and a new family, so just be sure that doesn't happen. That would make me a monster because it's my family, right? If, like, if I'm the captain of a ship and I'm like, it's totally cool, we're going to steer through the shoals, unless there's like a bad storm, in which case, like, <laughs> I'm getting off in the survival capsule. I want to wish you guys luck. That's criminal behavior. Yeah. So if the most successful people in your society are like honestly actively thinking about plan B, they should not be the leaders of your society at best. I kind of think maybe they should be in jail. That's what I think. But maybe you disagree. Maybe we shouldn't put them in jail. Obviously we should, but let's say we don't. They still shouldn't be the most powerful people in your society because they don't care about your society, demonstrably. What advice, what advice would you have? You're doing a lot with TCN to, to get the truth out. What advice would you have from everybody here to do in their own town, their village, wherever they live, to make a difference? Talk. Talk. That's all that matters, words. I mean, you look back on ancient civilizations, and even the really big ones, even Babylon, you know, in modern Iraq, was the biggest city Babylon was the biggest city in the world. And archaeologists couldn't even find out where it was. It was so destroyed. How do we know about Babylon? How do we know it even existed? Through words. Words are the only thing that endure. It's the only thing that endure through time. Words are the most powerful thing. And by the way, words are the first thing they seek to suppress when they want to control you. You can't say that. Oh, it's insensitive. No, it's a threat to your power. I'm not buying that. I'm not playing that game. I can say whatever I want. I'm not a slave. I'm a free man. And, but why is it always words first? It's the First Amendment protects words. The Second Amendment, second, not first, Second Amendment enshrines the right of self-defense in the Bill of Rights, the right to bear arms. But words are first. Words are the most important. So if you want to make a difference, you don't need to organize anything at first. You don't need to join anything at first. You don't need to be famous. All you need to do is tell the truth in whatever sphere you are. That includes Thanksgiving dinner. By the way, in a non-confrontational, polite, loving way. It doesn't need to, need to be a cable news jerk. That doesn't help often, I have found. In your own way. But never lie. If you commit to not lying, just try it. Do it like keto. Next three months, I'm not lying. I'm not going to say a single word that I don't believe to be true. If I can't say it, I won't. But nothing that leaves my lips will be deceptive or dishonest. Not one single word. Wait till you see what happens to you. You will, have a, you will be a different person. You'll be a different person. You will be a pulsating power center. It won't be your power, I'm just telling you. But that power will fill you. Just try it. Try the 30-day truth challenge. Who's, who's going to take the truth challenge? Let's go. 5,000 people and another 250,000 online. What does the term 10x mean to you? It means Tell the truth. 10x means like an explosion of goodness. Just like... 10x is almost hard to, because I'm not good at math, but I was like obsessing over 10x this morning. Think about 10x. I mean, obviously it's a financial term. 10x, we're going to blow it up 10x. But like, what does it actually look like? 10x is truly exponential. Like that's, you know, that's Jesus in the loaves. That's like, you know, four loaves feed 5,000 people. It's like, it's hard even to conceptualize that. That's what that is. Because exponential is literally exponential. It grows upon itself. So that's like a totally transformative experience, whether good or bad. But 10x is like a massive change from what we have now. That's what I think. Last question. I have to ask this question. I didn't want to be political. I'm not going to ask you about your political ambitions because I don't know that you have My any. political ambitions. Yeah, I don't think you have any. A non-existent. Okay. What happens in the next election? Who wins? Who runs? In, in this, this election, yeah. 2024? 2024? What? Six I mean, months? the short answer is I don't know, and, and, I, and I don't want to pretend that I do because that would be dishonest. Um, but I will tell you what my instincts are. I think Trump is going to win. Um, and I think Trump 
and I do think this is, this is the actual referendum on democracy. A guy I know from Brazil, which is an amazing country, anyone who hasn't been there. And Brazil, I, I don't, I'm not getting boring on Brazil, but it's, it's very much like the United States. Like, to a point, it's spooky when you go to Brazil. You're like, oh, wait, I recognize this. Wonderful people, smart people. Total disaster in Brazil right now. And, um, but they can see, people in other countries can see things more clearly, right? Like, if you're ever on a plane and someone tells you his life story and you're like, oh, I know what you need to do because I don't know too much. I don't know all the details. I see the big picture and it's super obvious what you need to do. Other people see our country in ways that are just like in blunter terms. Fewer details, and the outline is clearer. And this friend of mine from Brazil said, well, this is the referendum on democracy, this election. And I was like, well, isn't every election a referendum on democracy? He's like, yeah, strictly speaking, but this one is the last word in democracy because you have a senile president, and everyone knows he's senile. It's like, no, I mean, I'm not being mean, I'm just being honest. Like, look at him on TV. He's impaired, he shouldn't be in charge. He is weak. His weakness is the problem. His weakness, just weak leadership is the problem. It's always the problem. Everyone think it's bad leadership, evil leadership. No, 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 weakness. Weakness abets evil. Evil doesn't exist in the presence of strength. Mm. Only weakness. Mm. A weak leader, whether it's in the military, whether it's in business, whether it's in a family, a weak parent, will destroy the children. We have a weak leader, everyone knows that. One thing everyone doesn't want is a weak leader. He's literally senile. He can't get reelected. He can, no free and fair election would produce a victory for him prima facie. If, if all I know about him is that he has dementia, I'm not going to vote for him. Add to that, obviously, a degrading economy, total chaos, an invasion. Like all the, America's not gotten better in the last four years. It's become much, much worse. That's not a political statement. It's just true. It's measurable. Life expectancy has gone down. Suicide rate up. Drug addiction. It's like, name the measurement. They're all down. So if that guy wins, then there's no debating it. It's fake. It's a fake system. That didn't happen, okay? And the whole world will know that. There will be no more democracy globally. The United States invented the modern democracy. Of course, the Athenians invented it, but we, for thousands of years, no democracy till the United, till the United States. So the world looks to the US to understand what democracy is and whether it works. And if Joe Biden is reelected as a senile man who doesn't know anything about what his government is doing because he's not in charge of it, then we will know one thing. Democracy is fake, and no one else will imitate it. The only reason every other country in the civilized world has democracy is because we had it, and it seemed to be working. We made Coca-Cola, and it, the, the Chevrolet Cadillac, like, this is amazing. And now it produces Joe Biden? And whatever, you, even if you love Joe Biden, even if you're gonna vote for him, you can't say a man like that could win in a free and fair election, he couldn't. And so I think it's the biggest possible deal. And I think it is gonna be Biden. And of course they're gonna try and steal it as they stole the last one. True. And <laughs> that's true. You think they stole the last one? Well, they did steal the last uh -huh. one. They did steal the last one and they stole it. Well, they did it right in front of us. Not just by claiming that COVID somehow required us to have mail-in ballots whose you know, identities can't be verified. That's obviously you know, a bet's election theft makes fraud possible. No, they stole it by limiting the information that we had to make the decision about who to vote for. We couldn't read certain things. You can't have a democracy with censorship. A prerequisite for democracy is the free flow of information. If I don't know what I'm voting for, how can I vote for it? I can't. So if you have any censorship at all, you don't have a democracy. And we had mass censorship on COVID, on BLM, and on the Biden family. So like, that's just a fact. It's verified. It's, no one debates that. So that's not a free and fair election. They stole it. It's that simple. I don't know why everyone's like, well, are you saying the voting machines are rigged? Well, they certainly could have been. Any electronic voting machine can be rigged by definition. I don't know if they were. I don't have proof of that. But I don't need to have proof of that. They stole the election by censoring information that free American citizens needed to make a, an informed vote. It's that simple. So shut up. If you're for censorship, you're against democracy. I happen to be for democracy, so I wish people would say that, but the Republicans are so lame, they're like, oh, I can't talk about that. Okay. Tucker Carlson, folks. <laughs>